Hare Krishna. So thank you very much for coming today. And I'll speak this in separate parts. And during a one particular part, if the PowerPoint works out, I'll show some things on the PowerPoint. But broadly, is speaking on this topic about Krishna consciousness, science, science, myth or science. So let's talk about this in three different parts. The first part is what questions science answers and what it doesn't answer. And second part I'll talk is about what is spirituality and what does it provide us. And third is how can we practice spirituality? How and why we practice spirituality in the current age of science? <coughs> so science is a remarkably powerful body of knowledge, which has transformed the entire world around us in the last 200, 300 years. And especially so, the pace of technological change in the last 20, 30 years has been more than you could say in the last 200 years. <coughs> so, so there is no denying the power of science. Mm. At the same time, the promise with which the age of science and technology began that with scientific and technological advancement, we will have more and more prosperity, we will have more and more happiness, we will have <coughs> paradise on earth. That promise doesn't seem to have been fulfilled. At the very least, we see that technology and scientific progress it has made us comfortable, but it has not made us happy. So we could say today, people are comfortably unhappy. <laughs> so now how can we say that they're unhappy? Well, you can say that lots of people suffer from mental health problems, depression, anxiety, stress. And according to World Health Organization statistics, one million people commit suicide every year. That means one suicide every 40 seconds. And that means since I started this talk, almost five people have committed suicide. So, this one million people every year is actually more than the number of people who are killed in murders and violent crimes combined together. That means more than the number of people who are being killed by others are the people being killed by science. Sorry, not science. <laughs> people being killed by who? Themselves, yeah. <laughs> So now, here, le let me rephrase the argument. The point we're not saying that science is responsible for this. Suicide is a very complex, mental health problems are also very complex. The point we're making is that scientific and technological progress has not brought the promised paradise, has not fulfilled the potential, the promise for happiness. <coughs> That's okay, when we need it, you can fix it. <clears throat> so, what has gone wrong? The overall thesis of this class, I'll summarize now and then I'll come back to it over the class. Science can make things better. Spirituality can make people better. Science can make things better in incredible ways. You know, we can have floods coming and then we have predictions and so many lives can be saved. We can have <coughs> extreme heat and extreme cold and through technology we can protect ourselves. So science can make things better. 
and even many western thinkers have recognized Carl Jung, Sigmund Freud none of them were necessarily religious or, or theistic some of them were some of them were not but both of them Carl Jung and <coughs> Sigmund Freud were almost opposites but both of them recognize this point that the more outer power we have the more inner power we need the more outer power we have means technology can give us more and more power than what we had in the past today just by pressing a few buttons we can summon information from any part of the world and if somebody gets their hands on some destructive weapons just by pressing a few buttons they can kill people so now the more outer power we have the more inner power we need to use that outer power responsibly so science provides us outer power but science doesn't provide us inner power Martin Luther King put it very beautifully he said our scientific our technological power or he used the word scientific our scientific power has outrun our spiritual power we have guided missiles and misguided men we have guided missiles and misguided men so this is not to exclude women it is at that time the gender inclusive language men was a gender inclusive word at that time the point is that science is not moral science is not immoral science is amoral amoral means morality is not a part of science science studies the physical interactions between physical objects and tries to find out the mechanisms by which they work but how when we talk about morality morality is not some religious dogmatic imposition of certain codes but morality basically means how we should act now that knowledge is not within the domain of science this is again not to minimize science it is to contextualize science that science is very powerful in improving outer things science is very powerful in giving us access to outer powers that we did not have but science does not address the inner world inner world means see when we talk about morality it basically means decision making what should i do and what should i not do? so you could say there are two kinds of knowledge there is knowledge of matter and there is knowledge of what matters knowledge of matter science studies this and it studies very powerfully but knowledge of what matters what is really important so for example science can inform a young man that if he puts arsenic in his grandmother's breakfast he can get her inheritance very quickly <laughs> now this is just objective knowledge this is knowledge of matter now whether he should do it or not science doesn't tell that now of course scientists can themselves be moral people some scientists like any other human being some scientists may be immoral but their morality does not come from their science science is you could say value neutral this is the information if you do this this matter will interact with this in this way now whether you should do it or not that science doesn't tell albert einstein said that we can talk about the moral foundations of science but we can't talk about the scientific foundations of morality moral foundations of science means science should it be used moral how should it be used morally or immorally one of the most um, iconic and ironic uh, incidents of the 20th of the 20th century was 
Einstein's immense regret after the deployment of the atom bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It was Einstein who feared that Hitler might get hands on nuclear on atomic technology and make those bombs. And that's why he wrote a letter to the US president that you should make this. And eventually when it was used, E is equal to MC square was the most brilliant insight of the most brilliant person, you could say, of the last century, most brilliant scientist at least of the last century. And yet, that most brilliant insight of the most brilliant scientist of the last century was used to cause the worst destruction, the worst single incident of intentional man-made disaster, man-made destruction that humanity has seen. So, we have guided missiles and misguided men. <clears throat> now, this applies not see, when there is anger that is uncontrolled. Anger directed outward is aggression. Anger directed inward is depression. When we get angry with ourselves, you know, why am I not good enough? Why am I not smart enough? Why am I not slim enough? Why am I not fluent enough? Why am I not this, like this? Why am I not like that? Why couldn't I succeed over here? Why couldn't I do that? That is basically anger directed towards oneself. And that causes depression. Eventually, that anger is unrelenting, unforgiving. It can even make people suicidal. So here again, there is outer power in terms of technology. But inner power is, how do we use that outer power? So that outer power, I give two examples. One is the outer power being used destructively to destroy others. The other is outer power being used to destroy yourself. In, I was just a few, uh, I was some time ago in IIT Kharagpur. And I was giving a talk over there. And one of the prominent professors, actually of the department, he came and met me and he's saying that we are having a great uh, anxiety about IIT students committing suicide. So, what is IIT? Indian, Indian, Institute, of Technology. Indian Institute of Technology. One of the students who committed suicide, he wrote, IIT is Institute of Infinite Torture. <laughs> <laughs> so, now what happened? Several students committed suicide in more or less the similar way. What was that? They would have, you know, they would tie a rope from a fan, then stand on the chair, put the rope around their neck, and then use some kind of stick to turn on the fan. And when there is a series of suicides like that, the IIT management had an emergency meeting. So what do you do? How do we stop these suicides? And they passed a resolution unanimously with immediate effect. Replace in the hostels all the fans with air conditioners. <laughs> <laughs> now, the fans are not causing people to become suicide. <laughs> and obviously, they also know that. They're not foolish. But the point is that, see, you cannot very easily provide people inner power. So at least take away their outer power. So if they're using a particular means to commit suicide, just take that away from them. So here, what has happened is, through science and through technology, we have studied matter very well, or much better at least than a few centuries ago. But there is study of matter and there is study of what matters. What matters means what is really important in life. When we have to make choices, on what basis do we make choices? And actually speaking for us, we, if you consider when we function in the world, we are not so much interested in matter. We are interested in what matters. Say for example, if you come into this room. Now, if you are going to buy a new house, you might be interested in how is this house, what is the size, what is the color, what is the home arrangement. But if you just come for a program, your primary concern will be, is there a place for me to sit? 
isn't it? Is it so? When you hear, okay, is this place comfortable? Is this is the person next to me distracting me? Can I do I have need a backrest? Can I get one? So whatever is it, study of what matters. That is what is most important for us. So where uh, so now when I said that science does not talk about this, what science does is it analyzes matter. It analyzes the interactions of matters so that we can make it interact in a way that we can fulfill our desires. So it's too hot, I want cooling. So let's have fan. And that's, that's very helpful. But if we want to do a particular thing, science can help us to do it. But what should we do? That science doesn't tell. I mean, we say, no, I don't want anyone to tell me what I should do. I'll do whatever I want. That's okay as a just a thought to have. But actually, we all want ultimately to have a life that is meaningful. We want to do something worthwhile in our life. We all need a purpose to move forward. And this is something which we need an alternative source of knowledge for this. <clears throat> Science studies the universe. But spirituality talks about why the universe exists. How the universe works, science can tell us. But why does it exist? That science doesn't tell us. Stephen Weinberg is a Nobel laureate scientist. And he, he very poignantly place, states the irony of scientific advancement. He says, the more the universe becomes comprehensible, the more it seems pointless. The more the universe becomes comprehensible. That means, <coughs> say, why do planets move the way they do? Why do fruits fall from the sky? Why do things happen the way they do? The more we understand this, what is saying, the more it seems pointless. So why does it exist? Well, there's no point to existence. So this is a very counterintuitive statement. Say, for example, if I'm giving a class <coughs> and somebody sends a note to me. I look at that note and I just it just seems to be scribbled to me. Now, if somebody has written that note down and sent it to me, then obviously, and right in the middle of the class, if they're given this note, it's not scribble. It was something meaningful. Maybe it's in a language that I don't understand. That's why it doesn't make sense to me. So I look at it carefully. And suppose somebody gives us a, a mess, something which is very carefully scripted. It's not just graffiti. But it makes no sense. And then you start studying it very carefully. Okay, you know, okay, this particular shape of this letter, I think this means this. And this combination of letters means this. We put in lots of effort and then we figure out the letters, the words, the sentences. And then they all start, yeah, this is this letter, this is this word, this is this sentence. So like that, you start making sense of what the letters, the words and sentences are. But the more you understand the script, the less what is written seems meaningful. And you say, something is wrong over here. If somebody has written this in a script, gone through all the trouble of writing the script, there must be some reason why they have written it, isn't it? There must be some meaning to it. So if it was just give, just graffiti, then we could say, it's just not it, but something's carefully written. Then there must be some meaning to it. So similarly, we see that the world is orderly. Science functions based on the presumption. In science, the word uses axiom. Axio axioms that this, that the world uh, is orderly, that nature works according to laws and science tries to uncover the laws. So we can make sense of, okay, why do temperature go up and down like this? Why do waves come like this? Why do planets move like this? Why did this happen? Why did that happen? All this we understand, but why does this whole thing exist? We don't understand. There must be 
something which we are missing. Now, in general, in science, whenever um, a particular theory doesn't make sense, in science tries to put it in a bigger framework. Say, for example, Newtonian physics was the bedrock of science till the 20th century. Um, and it is called classical physics. And it explained the world very well to a particular point. But at the extremes, at the macroscopic level, objects, huge objects moving at the speed of light or near the speed of objects, huge objects moving very fast, they didn't seem to be obeying Newton's laws. And very small objects, fundamental particles, they also didn't seem to be obeying those laws. So then science wanted to do, oh, this doesn't make sense. No, maybe there is some other principle over there. Maybe there's some bigger picture, which can help us to make sense of things. So that's for expanding that, science came up with a the theory of relativity. And gravity uh, and Newtonian physics basically became like a subset within the theory of relativity. And for small objects, science came up with, for microscopic objects, science came up with what? You know, quantum physics. So basically, we need, when science has a particular operational theory and it doesn't make sense, it expands the framework to make sense of things. So similarly, what what spiritual texts like the Bhagavad Gita offer us is an expanded framework. So expanded framework means it tells us that we at our core are conscious beings. We are spiritual beings and we are all looking for happiness. Now what science does is, science addresses us things at the physical level and makes them comfortable. But happiness is not just based on physical comforts. It is based on a meaningful life. How can we say that it's not based on physical comforts? So suppose, how many of you like humor? Hmm? No. Anybody who doesn't like humor hmm, is either strange or they are lying. <laughs> Almost everybody likes humor. But suppose somebody told you, say from tomorrow onward, you will have no family responsibility, no financial responsibility. From morning to evening, just sit and watch comedies for the rest of your life. How many of you would like it? Maybe for a few hours. After that, hey, I want to do something. I want to do something. We want happiness, but we want meaningful happiness. Just watching comedies and laughing, that is meaningless happiness. So what science does is, science provides us comforts. But science, in terms of the big picture, does not provide us meaning. Meaning means why do we exist? What is the purpose why the universe exists? So this, this is a question which is fundamental for us to find meaningful happiness. Um, so that we need to expand our picture. What's now science and spirituality, sometimes people think that they are opposites, but they're not opposites. Science studies material reality. Now, whether there's anything beyond matter, science doesn't study that. Why? Because science looks at the material mechanisms governing governing reality and tries to find them out. Now, is there something beyond beyond matter? <clears throat> Actually speaking, if we use completely the scientific approach, uh, if some, now if you take scientific approach in terms of proof of science, the most the strictest proof is mathematical proof in science. Mm -hmm. Then you could have more like uh, other kinds of proof where there is experiment and there is inference drawn from it. Now if somebody asked you, okay, does your mother love you? Now, 
you know, most of us would say, yeah, yes. But then, give me scientific proof that your mother loves you. <laughs> well, you know, how, how, how do you give scientific proof for that? Love is not a quantifiable thing. No, we can have a thermometer, we can have a barometer, we can't have a loveometer. <laughs> Nowadays, people have so much insecurity about relationships. I did a seminar in America on overcoming fear. So the top 10 fears of people in the 18th century, 19th century, 20th century, 21st century, analyze. In the 21st century, two fears have been added to the top 10 list. <laughs> One is the fear of terrorists and the other is fear of rejection. That we form a relationship or try to enter into a relationship, maybe the other person, person rejects us and goes away. So when, whenever we are forming a relationship, we want to know, does the other person really care for me? Does the other person really love me? Now, if, say, a boy proposes to a girl, you know, I love you, please marry me. And then she takes out a love meter. Let's put it on your heart. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, love is not quantifiable. But is love real? Of course it's real. We have all experienced love. Mm -hmm. And so, that which is not mathematical, that is not quantifiable, science cannot even prove its existence. So what to speak of love, there is no scientific proof that you exist. Scientific proof exists because you exist. When I say there is no scientific proof that you exist, what do you, what do you mean? Of course, we can say that this, your body, you have particular weight, particular height, particular physical dimension, that's fine. But that is not you. You as a conscious being, where do you exist? In the brain, you know, we experience ourselves as an integrated consciousness. That means, you know, we experience things in a united way. But there is no one point of the brain which is connected to everywhere else in the brain which can experience this united consciousness. So, as far as you as a conscious observer, there is no scientific proof that you exist. But scientific proof exists because you exist. It is you who are, you means you as a human being, you as a scientist, it is you who have, who have observed and have come up with scientific proofs. So there are certain things which are foundational. And when we talk about this big picture, science doesn't, strictly speaking, if you look at science, science doesn't talk about that which is non-material. Now, some scientists may have opinions. So there may be atheists who may say that nothing material, but non, nothing non-material exists. There may be theistic scientists who may say actually material, non-material things exist. But strictly speaking, that is beyond the domain of science. But the most important things in our life. It is Arvind Schrodinger who said that you know, the things that matter the closest to the heart, oh, things about right and wrong, things about beauty and ugliness, things about death and immortality, things about uh, <clears throat> about beauty, about these things you know which we experience very deeply. We experience beauty, we experience injustice, we experience death. Now about these things, science is ghastly silent. It doesn't, okay, science doesn't tell us, sci science cannot tell us whether the, if you use a Photoshop and you make a particular image. Science can tell you this is 30% red, 35% yellow, 26% this. But this, the computer itself can't tell you this is beautiful. That requires a conscious observer to tell us that. So basically, what happens, science divides things uh, divides observed reality into primary and secondary properties. In science, primary properties are those which are, say, physically measurable. Height, weight, breadth, <coughs> like that. Uh, speed, those things. But when we meet people, when we interact in the world, you know, if somebody comes, you know, I met a very interesting person today. Oh, really? 
What is interesting? A person is 5 feet 5 inches, 66 kg. Really? <laughs> That's not interesting. <laughs> maybe they are 5.5 feet or maybe they are 175 kg. Maybe that might be a little unusual. But we don't experience the world in terms of physical dimensions primarily. What we experience is, as I said, we experience say color, taste, beauty. We experience fairness, unfairness. We experience death, life. So this is what we primarily experience. This is what defines our life. Physical dimensions don't primarily define our life. It is, it is what how we experience uh, reality, and which is so all these you know for science, taste, uh, smell, taste, fragrance, beauty, all these are secondary qualities because they are not quantifiable. But in our experience, these are primary qualities. So what what spiritual knowledge focuses on is what is primary for us. Consciousness, love, experiences. This is what is primary. And what the, the Bhagavad Gita and the Bhakti literature in general tell us is that we all can gain inner power by purification. Inner power means that within us there is a dark side and there is a bright side. There is something within us which tells us to do bad things. There is something which tells us to do good things. So, now good and bad here don't have to be in a moral sense. It can just be in a functional sense also. Bad. One of my friends was telling me he had gone high on top of a mountain. Uh, one of the, to the tallest mountains. And he was looking down from the peak and he's peering and suddenly he fell. <coughs> Something within, I just heard a voice, jump down. Hey, what? <laughs> says, Nobody who spoke that. It was like some dark voice within, jump down. So, now, now of course this was his experience, but we all had these promptings, you know. Do some things which we know are bad for us. Which we know we should not do. So, if this voice, this power becomes very strong, then we hurt ourselves and we hurt others. When our lower side becomes very strong, then either we hurt ourselves or we hurt others. But if our higher side becomes strong, then we can do good to ourselves and we can do good for others. So what spirituality tells us is that this inner world is not just chaotic. It might some, sometimes appear chaotic. But order can be created in that world. How is that order created? That why are there why are there these dark forces within us and why are there these bright forces within us? I'll conclude with one one point of discussion and <clears throat> then we can have questions. So why are there these dark forces? Why are there these bright forces within us? So what spirituality, what the Bhagavad Gita tells us is that the the bright side comes from our deepest core we we are godly because we are parts of god in 15:7 the bhagavad gita krishna says mama ivam sho jeeva loke jeeva bhuta sanatana mana shashthani indriyani prakriti sthani karshati that mama ivam sho jeeva krishna says all living beings are my parts, but they are covered by the mind and senses. So, <clears throat> now there are two broad theories of human nature. This is a big subject, but I will keep it very brief. One theory says that people are innately good. And once people, people are innately good. Innately. Innately, innately. innately. innately good. <clears throat> and one theory says people are innately bad. So what do you think? Are people innately good or are people innately bad? Both. Innately what are people? Sorry? Good? Okay. Are people innately bad? Okay, let me soften this question. 
are some people innately bad yeah. very few, yeah. <laughs> very few. <laughs> <laughs> so now broadly speaking the communist the leftist ideology is that people are innately good the situations make them bad so we change society we do social engineering and people's goodness will manifest mm -hmm. the now this is true sometimes sometimes people are in terrible situations and that just makes them do terrible things but we do see that sometimes two people might be in similar poverty stricken background they were born but one grows up to become responsible and successful and another becomes a criminal so we are not just products of our situations so the now the broadly speaking the christian idea is that although we are made in the image of god but we have all committed an original sin and that's why people are innately sinful so adam was the first person who committed a sin and because of that sin has passed down like a genetic defect for everyone and so people are innately sinful unless there is the intercessionary grace of jesus in their lives hmm? they will stay sinful and they will go to hell and there's a problem with this idea that it's true that people do terrible things but we can see that there are good people also and there may be people who may be completely atheistic and still they may be good people so there's no jesus in their life there's no god in their life but they're human they're good human beings so what's going on over here so what the so are people innately good or innately bad the bhagavad gita tells us that there are there are two levels of innateness there is innateness in the sense of the soul and there is innateness in the sense of the mind so that means inside us our existence is three level body mind and soul so <clears throat> at the level of the soul everyone being a part of god is godly so everyone has a potential for goodness but everyone's that potential for goodness is covered by the mind and the mind has different kinds of impressions so if the mind's impressions are very dark then that person might seem to be innately evil mm -hmm. that just from child some some children right from childhood itself you know they're in the they're in the they're in the crib and they cry so loudly that they seem to bring the whole house down see some children babies are relatively calm and relatively silent so we see that there is innate characteristics also in the sense that they come from birth so now at the level of the mind depending on the kind of impressions people have uh, and we all have some dark impressions some good impressions but the potential for goodness doesn't automatically manifest you could say at the level of the soul there is a potential for goodness at the level of the mind there is a propensity for vice there is a propensity for wrong doing and the potential for goodness has to struggle against this propensity for vice <clears throat> so how does this potential for goodness manifest <clears throat> the easiest way is to connect it with the all good being so when we connect ourselves with god not in a ritualistic sense oh just want to show the world how religious i am but in a devotional sense if we practice bhakti yoga for connecting with god we will find that our potential for goodness will manifest more and more our potential for virtue will grow and whatever propensity for vice is there it will go away it will go away and there will be whatever we are we will become better human beings as it science makes things better spirituality makes people better so whatever we are we will become better by our spiritual practices and in this sense of self transformation in this sense of self empowerment spirituality is also scientific scientific in the sense that there is <coughs> a procedure given there is a predicted result and we can follow the procedure and we will experience the result <clears throat> so i'll conclude with a personal experience and then we can have some questions now when i was studying in college i was studying my engineering so i was from my beginning had a lot of faith in the power of education so i felt that if people would be educated they would have more choices and they can create a better life for themselves 
So when I was studying engineering, I joined a social service organization and I started going to nearby slums on behalf of that organization to offer free tuitions to the uh, kids over there. I taught English, <coughs> history, maths, subjects like that. And then as I was, talk, well, I was doing those tuitions, then I slowly became friends with them and those kids opened up. Most of them were from dysfunctional families. Alcoholism was rampant, domestic violence was there. And as they started telling their harrowing tales, and at sometimes I used to think that maybe they were there. Most of it was the male in the house, the father was violent. So generally, if you hear this kind of story, you think that person is, must be a terrible person. But then, you know, when I would talk with their fathers whenever they would be at home, they are nice people. And they were grateful to me that I was coming and teaching their children. And then these kids would tell me that, but when they drink alcohol, they become like a different person entirely. So, at that time I started thinking that, to when their home is so chaotic, how much is my teaching them uh, history or maths really going to help them? So, our social service organization decided to expand further and we decided to get into anti-alcoholism to help people become free from alcohol. And we got some experts to speak and basically the campaign, we did some kind of uh, campaigning and it was reasonably successful. One of my friends used to go to a nearby village and that village almost entirely became sober. So we considered that a big success. But one evening, I would go to the slums and this friend would go to the village. He came back and he looked shattered. I said, what happened? He said there was a local uh, municipality elections and one of the political candidates in order to woo the people had brought three truckloads of free liquor for everyone. And not only the fathers but even their kids had drunk. And then when I heard this I started thinking that actually through education I'm opening doors for them. I'm trying to open doors for them. But there's something within them which stops them from walking through those doors. So what is that? So that's the time I started becoming more interested in trying to understand the human person. What makes us tick? That's how I was introduced to the Bhagavad Gita. And then in Bhagavad Gita 336, I read Arjuna's question. What is it that makes people act against their best interests? Atakena prayuktoyam so, as if by force, people seem to be pushed to do things which hurt them. And that question just resonated with me at that time. And then understanding the answer took a long time. It's a complex, it's a little complex philosophy. But eventually, when I understood this point, that actually Everybody has a mind and it has a lot of dark impressions within them. And <clears throat> unless those dark impressions are counted, unless they are purified, no matter how much outer power we may give them, it won't really lead to any significant good in their lives. So spirituality, what it does is, it helps the soul connect with the Supreme Soul. So when you practice Bhakti Yoga, the essence of Bhakti Yoga is we connect the finite soul with the infinite soul. So there are certain practices like we have Kirtan, like we have classes, we have Satsang, we have Puja. But the purpose of all of these is to bring this connection. And if this connection is brought out in an authentic way, not just as a ritual, but authentically for the purpose of establishing a personal loving connection, then that connection leads to purification. Purification means that that say that the dark impressions that are there within the mind, they get cleansed. And once they are cleansed, then the soul's potential for goodness, for virtue manifests. And then whatever power we have externally, we can use it constructively. So technology is a great power. Science can be a great blessing. But we need to be mature enough to use this power and to tap this blessing. And unfortunately, science and technology themselves don't empower us. They empower us externally, but they don't empower us internally. 
for that inner empowerment we need spirituality so this is a time tested process anybody in any part of the world if they practice bhakti yoga genuinely they'll find that whatever darkness might be there within them there might be anger there might be greed there might be lust there might be uh, <coughs> anxiety there might be negativity there might be uh, <coughs> suspiciousness all kinds of negativity that are there those will start going down they start going down and we will become better human beings and we when we become better human beings we all can contribute for creating a better world and thus through science we can make things better through spirituality we can make ourselves better and thus we can help making ourselves and the world a better place through a combined application of science and spirituality so i'll summarize i spoke today on this topic of <coughs> science and uh, so do we need spirituality in the age of science oh. so i started by talking about <coughs> i said i'll talk about what science provides and what it does not provide so science studies matter and understands how material phenomena work and that's very powerful and science has transformed the world around us but we have guided missiles and misguided men because so science provides us outer power but science is not moral immoral it is a moral it only tells us how to do what but what to do it doesn't tell us so science uh, divides the world into primary and secondary properties so the primary properties are quantifiable properties mm -hmm. so length breadth velocity like that but for us so there are the issues that science addresses but that which science does not address is also extremely important for us now, love is the fundamental reality for us but the science cannot provide us a love meter to measure it so in within the scientific world even we as conscious observers don't exist there is no scientific proof that we exist but scientific proof exists because we exist so there is a whole world which is non there's a there's a whole level of reality which is non material and that is foundational for our very lived experience and what is this level of reality so that analyze that beyond the material there is the mental and the spiritual so are people innately good or innately bad there are two levels of innateness at the level of the mind because of the impressions we have a propensity for vice but below the mind is the soul and at the level of the soul all of us have a potential for virtue and the potential for virtue has to fight against the propensity for vice and manifest so what technology does is technology and science and technology are value neutral it will just provide us resources now what we do with it it's up to us so science can make things better spirituality can make people better that means we have a dark side we have a bright side so what bhakti yoga itself is a science in the sense that it tells us that if we connect with the supreme we connect with the all good supreme then the goodness within us will manifest <clears throat> and this is a transformation which we all can experience if we practice bhakti yoga and somebody says oh, i don't believe in this all non material stuff then what do we have we end up with the irony that the more the universe becomes comprehensible the more it seems pointless it's like we see the whole script everything is written in a script but nothing makes sense what is going on so if we stick to the only the material level of reality we can understand why this how this works how this works how this works but why anything exists there is no answer for it so but it is spirituality understanding that there is a soul the soul is a part of god the soul is on a journey towards god the closer the soul comes to god the more the soul's goodness manifests that makes our life meaningful and then when we live meaningfully the happiness that we get is what will fulfill our hearts so through science we can create we can make things better through spirituality we can make ourselves better and in that way 
Each of us can become an agent to create a better world. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes. Any so questions or comments? Just time, please take this opportunity to clarify your doubts and from up, tomorrow onwards you can become a spiritual man, a better person, no? make yourself better. But still if you have doubts, I'm not believing that one class will completely take your doubts. Just take it out, take it out, ask questions. Don't just sit idly yes, please. and then please will go and say again, doubt again. Please ask. Will the mic go till the end? Opportunity, yes. Otherwise you can speak, I'll repeat. Why does the universe Okay, good question. <laughs> so why does the universe actually exist? Basically two purposes. It's experimentation and redirection. So we are all souls. We have free will basically. And <clears throat> so uh, let's uh, see with respect to this, why the universe exists. Uh, there are basically two different modes of reasoning. One is that <coughs> we accept certain axioms and then see if what we are observing makes sense based on those axioms. So that is like you could say back to front reasoning. So let's do that kind of reasoning over here. Let's try to understand what, what the spiritual texts say about this and then we see whether it gels with our lived experience. So Basically, we are souls who are parts of God and as souls, we, uh, we can get the fullest happiness in loving God. Mm -hmm. But love requires free will. Mm -hmm. Without free will, there is only force, there cannot be any love. So the very existence of free will means that there has to be an arena where free will can be exercised. So what the... Bhagavad Gita says there are two worlds. There is a physical material world, there is a spiritual world. So in the spiritual world, the soul love God and delight with Him eternally. For those souls who do not wish to love God, there has to be an alternative place. And that place is this world. So the world serves two purposes. Experimentation. That means, okay, I don't want to love God. I want to find happiness in some other way. Okay, try it out. The world offers us many different alternatives. Try this, try this, try this, experimentation. And through all the experimentation that we do, we are on a journey of spiritual evolution. Spiritual evolution means, oh, this doesn't work. I tried this, it doesn't make me happy. Maybe I have to try this, try this. But through all these experiences, we evolve. We evolve in our capacity to learn, in our capacity to love. And eventually, when we understand it, Actually, it is loving God that will give me the deepest happiness. Then there is a redirection. So the world offers us facilities for experimentation and facilities for redirection. It depends on what we want to choose. I was in Melbourne and I was some asked a, somebody asked a question. If God wants us to be good, then why are there so many bad options in the world? The bad choices seem to be so many and good choices are so few. So why is that? So I said, that's how it always is in any multiple choice exam. <laughs> <laughs> so four wrong choices, one right choice. Now We can't blame the teacher for that. Uh -huh. The teacher gives us the choices, but the teacher also gives us the education where you can make the right choice. So for all of us, this world serves the purpose of experimentation as long as you want to experiment. And then it serves the purpose of redirection. For those who want to redirect themselves. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Prabhu, sorry. Uh, the ba bad options, I think that options are created by humans, not by the God. So, mm, so okay. Are the bad options created by human beings or are created by God? Yeah. It depends on what you mean by bad options. Say for example, nature works under God's direction. Nature provides the nutritious f fruits. Nature also provides poisonous herbs so you could say that good and bad are both coming in nature it's up to us how we use it so if you want to use uh, uh, good and bad in terms of things that affect us in good and bad ways 
that is in nature already there because the nature of nature of nature is that it's competitive so one living being exists on another living being so there are basically you can say there are two kinds of evil in the world there is natural evil and there is moral evil natural evil means bad things exist on the outer world so when bad things happen to us that is natural evil say say a tsunami occurs earthquake occurs and that's terrible but moral evil is where people act wrongly so that's in that sense natural evil is tragedy moral evil is actually evil evil basically means that uh, to produce suffering for the purpose of producing suffering like there some people are sadists they delight in causing pain to others so narad muni saw this hunter brugari he was a hunter that was his profession to kill animals but he was half killing them he says why are you doing this so moral evil is not created by god natural evil in terms of natural forces which uh, can sometimes hurt us and can sometimes shelter us if the earth shelters us i was in wellington and i was giving a class and everybody started shaking I said what happened I said there was an earthquake and everybody was so calm i said what is this now we have an earthquake once a week really <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're so minor most of the time that nobody notices them also <laughs> but sometimes they become quite intense <laughs> so the earth that shelters us can sometimes uh, destroy us also so in terms of natural evil is that that's not in our control so nature you could say is it sometimes gives good it sometimes gives bad and if you say nature works under god then we can say that nature is acting in both ways depending on various factors so that moral evil in terms of we choosing wrong actions that is not done by god god doesn't force us to do wrong choices the god guides us to do right choices but we do wrong choices so in that sense it's true that god doesn't create the bad things that means god doesn't impel us to moral evil okay thank you yes yeah please how can one practice bhakti yoga on daily basis like simple steps how can you practice bhakti yoga on a daily basis yeah i would say broadly we talk about abc abcd have you heard of that a is association is come in association of spiritually minded people and that itself will inspire us and guide us and give us a social support it will energize us its association see this our desires see ultimately i talk about bhakti yoga means that our desires become purified they become elevated hmm? so our desires are not just linear they are also triangular what do i mean linear desire that if we see something and then oh i want it say if somebody says somebody brings a plate of gulab jamun filled with gulab jamun gori hey i want to eat it you see the object and we get the desire you no know, many years ago first time i had gone to australia so i had gone to one devotee's house and they were serving food so for dessert they had baklava have any of you know what is baklava yeah. <laughs> okay so yeah it's arabic sweet isn't it i think something like that so first time i had gone i had never heard of a baklava so this would you like to have baklava <laughs> now the word baklava doesn't sound very sweet <laughs> <coughs> so i said maybe later hmm? then there's another devotee with me he said you give me then he took it and he ate it and he was relishing it so much i looked at it and says give me one also <laughs> so this is triangular desire <laughs> just seeing the baklava did not create the desire but seeing somebody relishing the baklava created the desire so association taps the triangularity of desires so we might may or may not feel interested in the bhagavad gita but if you associate with people who are interested in the bhagavad gita and they are relishing it they are getting so many insights from it hey, i also want to study this so association is very important that that brings us to these books reading books reading books like bhagavad gita reading uh, this gives us intellectual understanding of why we are doing see is chanting that is chanting of mantras like the hari krishna mantra chanting spiritual sounds spiritual sound is a very powerful way to spiritualize our consciousness and d is diet or dt worship you know dt and diet so we were like we have the temple 
uh, here beautiful altar so we worship the lord so if you do this a b c d we can all incorporate spirituality into our life and practice bhakti yoga okay thank you yes please uh, is god concerned with our devotion or love what how are you differentiating between the two Okay, so will say love, loving other human beings take people closer, take somebody closer to God, or will devoting oneself to God take one closer to God? That's the question. Uh, if a person has done devotion, yeah, but, but is loving the life, little loving life. Okay, that's a good question. See, there are two different things over here. That first of all, all living beings are parts of God. So if we are loving anyone other than ourselves. Hmm, then that indicates that at least we have come out of self-centeredness. Mm -hmm. So that is indicative of an evolved consciousness. And an evolved consciousness is very suitable for taking us towards God. So in that sense, somebody who lives a loving, relatively selfless life is much better than somebody who lives a self-centered life. At the same time, the abode of God is a place where everyone loves God. Mm -hmm. and if you go there and if you don't have love or devotion for God you are using the word devotion then you know we we will be in the kingdom of God and we will be asking you know what is the cricket score mm -hmm. we will not be interested over there mm -hmm. so God won't force us to go into a place where we are not interested in so if we love human beings that's very good but just by uh, it also depends on how we love human beings so there could be two ways. One is that we love God and we see all living beings as parts of God. And then we love them. If that is the way, we see people as parts of God and then love them because they are parts of God. Then that love for them is also enhancing our love for God. But for that we need to have some special, specific devotional practices that foster our love for God. So we have horizontal relationship with others in the world. And we have vertical relationship with God. Mm -hmm. So ideal situation is these two are symbiotic. That the vertical relationship with God makes us more mature, more stable. And thus we can love others more, we love, can love others better. Oh. So the horizontal nourishes the world, the vertical nourishes the horizontal. And if the people around us are also godly. And seeing their devotion inspires us and that also strengthens our vertical relationship. So ideal is where the horizontal and vertical are symbiotic. So if in that sense our devotion nourishes our love for others, that's very good. That, that loving others in that context will take us towards God. But sometimes the, we may have no vertical, it's only horizontal. Then ultimately what we are most attached to in this life, that is what we will attain in the next life. So if somebody is fully attached to humanity and making life better for human beings, then if God is not there in their consciousness, they are not attached to God, they, they will not go back to God. They will go to a, some other destination where they can continue to do what they are attached to do. Now sometimes it might be that some people love God, sorry, love people but they are completely, not, not only are they apathetic towards God, they are antipathetic towards God. And I saw the slogan of one uh, social self welfare organization. They said that God in double quotes, God sends disasters, we send relief. Now this is a demoniac way of thinking. God doesn't send disasters. So, but their idea is that we are better than God. So now if somebody is caring for people but with this attitude, then that definitely won't take them towards God. So we have to see specifically the consciousness in which somebody is doing something. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. There's a question here. I have a question. Yeah. Um, when I was a child, I used to do this. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare. Mm -hmm. But when I come here, we start with Krishna, and then go to Rama. Mm -hmm. Why is that 
ओके व्हाई डू वी स्टार्ट विद हरे कृष्ण एंड ऑफ हरे राम एक्चुअली एसेंशियली देर इज नो डिफरेंस बिकॉज इट्स अ मंत्रा इट्स साइक्लिकल सो वेदर वी स्टार्ट विद कृष्णा और राम अल्टीमेटली वी कम बैक एंड कंप्लीट अ सर्कल इट्स सो इधर वे वी चैंड इट इट्स इट्स फाइन द रीजन वाई वी चैंड विथ हरे कृष्ण मंत्रा इज दैट द द हरे द मंत्रा स्टार्टिंग फ्रॉम हरे राम इज कंसिडर्ड बी अ वैदिक मंत्र and vedic mantras there are certain strict rules for chanting them although those rules may not be followed now by many people but the power of those mantras is maximum when they are chanted with proper purification with proper uh, rites of sanctification and other is also there may be benefit but there will be lesser benefit but there are certain mantras so this is vedic mantra but if we start it from hari krishna now there is a tradition of chanting hari krishna also in if you look at the scriptures there are mentions to the hari krishna mantra also but uh, that is not the hari mantra from starting with hari ram was considered the vedic mantra so uh, those who felt that the vedic mantra cannot be chanted by the unqualified people mm? so for them there is a special arrangement made that you start the mantra with hari krishna so there is a ancient story of how uh, particular person was so sinful that he couldn't chant the name ram 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 so he was told chant the name mara mara the mara is the name of the god of death chanted mara 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 what happened it became ram so like that if we chant from hari krishna it eventually becomes the same mantra so we can get the same benefit of the chanting of the vedic mantra but without any of the hazards any of the limitations of the lack of purity okay thank you So, bro, you said um, it means like qualification, right? You need qualification for to start like. Uh, Hari Ram, yes. Hari Krishna, yes. Uh, one question. Yeah. We'll come to you, sir. Yeah. What will uh, happen after you know a person died? What will happen to his soul? Okay. What will happen to the soul of a person after he dies? Yes. It depends on. their desires broadly speaking the body is like a dress or a house for the soul so we are if you consider a house we are tenants in this house now when the period of tenancy ends where do where, where do we go we go to another house and which house do we get it depends on two things our desires and our budget so similarly when the soul, soul dies that means its period of tenancy in this body is over it will go to another body which body that depends on what kind of desire the soul has cultivated and the budget is determined by the karma so what kind of karma the person has done so if we do if we do good activities we we'll, and we do all, we do devotional activities then we also cultivate divine desires then we become elevated urdhvam gachhanti satvastha madhye tishtanti rajasa jaganya guna vrittistha adho gachhanti tamasa Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita in fourteen twenty uh, fourteen eighteen that depending on the way we live, so if we live in goodness, a life of virtue, we get elevated. That means we get a better life, a healthier body, greater 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 intelligence, greater in wisdom. So like that, madhye tishtu de rajasa. If we live very, if we live a passionate, attached life, then we stay at this level of reality itself. But if somebody lives a very Mm. acts uh, reprehensibly hurting others committing uh, forbidden activities then they get degraded they go to a lower existence where there is a greater propensity for evil there is greater distress uh, so it's like depending on how you live and how you earn when you are living in your present house you can get a better house or a similar house or a worse house the best situation is that while we are living in the temporary world if we can develop our love for the eternal we will all love something because we can't live without love but in the human form the soul has the consciousness that can evolve enough to perceive the eternal and to pursue the eternal so if we pursue the eternal if we love krishna love god then by the end of our life we will attain him that is like we leave this house to get a permanent house see god is eternal and if we love the eternal more than the temporary 
then we attain the eternal world. So in the spiritual world, we get a spiritual body. And that is the best result that we can get from our life. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but when it reaches to God, that's the end point, you say? Yeah, so there, with God, we have an eternal life of love with Him. That is called Leela. So where we have various, we have a particular role, and in that role, we serve in various ways, and we reciprocate love. But you know, in the beginning of uh, Bhagavad Gita, there is, uh, you know, sloka comes, uh, you know, and uh, what I have to say, for every person, you can't have a death, and you can't have a reborn, rebirth, right? So, if I die, and my soul reaches to Krishna, so will it stay there, or it will reborn, and if it reborns, how it will reborn? Okay. So, the Bhagavad Gita says that every soul is... <coughs> for there is death and then there is rebirth. Yes. Okay, that's true. Jatasya hi dhruva mrutya, dhruva janma mrutasya, yeah. smad parihari arti natvam shuchitu marasi. Yeah. So, now what that exactly means is that when we exist at this level of reality, existence at this level is going to end. Yeah. And then there is going to be existence either at this level or some other level of reality. So, when there is a Dhruvam Janma Mrutasya What that refers to is not necessarily a return to this level of existence. See, basically when we give up this house, we are going to get some house. Whether it is temporary or permanent. Most of the times if you are not earned enough, you might just get another temporary house. If you earned enough, we can get a permanent house. So there, Janma is used in an inclusive sense, not in a specific sense that we will get another physical body. It means that when our existence at this level ends, our existence somewhere else will begin. So whether that can be in the material world or that can be in the spiritual world. So if you go to the spiritual world, then we don't come back. Because the experimentation part is over, the redirection has been done, it has been successful, and then we don't have to come back. <coughs> okay, thank you. And in relation to that, uh, so the population is going on increasing. So does souls create new, I mean every time new soul will be created, so okay. Is yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, does the is the pop, how is the population increasing? Are new souls being created? Uh, mm, souls are eternal, but the souls exist in various bodies. So, you know, we may say the population is increasing, but we are only talking about human population. Souls are existing in say wherever there is life, there is a soul. So if we compared, say, if you say before 500 years ago and now human population increased. But we could very well compare and say, as compared to 500 years ago, maybe the tree population has decreased. Isn't it? So, souls who are in other bodies have come to these bodies. So it's not that this, this new souls are created, but rather new souls, uh, so or rather so more souls are getting human bodies. If you consider the vastness of time and space, the, the whole phenomena of population explosion is seen in context. All it means, it's, when you say population explosion, it's more like population concentration. I suppose somebody from a, uh, somebody, some extraterrestrial being came to this planet Earth and they were sent on the reconnaissance to find out what kind of people live on the Earth. And suppose that E.T. came over here in the background for last one hour they hovered over here. And they observed and went back and gave a report. So you know, the earth consists mostly of Indians who are very spiritually minded. <laughs> <laughs> now that would be a very small sample and a very broad extrapolation from that. So yes, it's Indians but okay they are Indians, they are here for some time. They will go back after some time. So like that it's more of population concentration which has come from different species. So if the population of one particular species is increasing, that means souls from other species have, more souls from other species have come into that species. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is also a part of, I mean, his question. He was in discussion with me and, you know, uh, uh, from the matter he gave an answer, but, uh, you know, I wanted it. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, and another question, which is also from my friend, uh, I mean, this is very low level one, but uh, still I would like to ask. 
So, Draupadi, uh, you know, when uh, she had a bad humiliation, uh, she she sh says that uh, you know she uh, her husband should take revenge on him. You know, until then she will not tie her hair, and you know she she takes that oath. So, what my friend asks is, okay, so one of I mean because of her madrila, somehow her life is ruined. So, is it? Is it okay that she take a revenge or some kind of like okay something bad should happen to her? Is it okay to think like that because she got harmed from uh, you know her? So she says like, am I good or bad by thinking like this? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so when Draupadi was humiliated, she demanded that her husband take revenge against those who are humiliated. So if say if we we are being troubled by say some are by our in laws, by our mother in law, should we take should we also desire that they be heard like that? And is such a desire good or bad? See there are there are degrees. Hmm? There is weakness and there is wickedness. Weakness means all of us have weakness. Weakness means say somebody is angry. So all of us, to some extent, have anger, and see, we have within us our intelligence, our conscience, which tells us don't yell, don't get angry. But then we get angry, and then afterward we realize I shouldn't have done this. Then we go and apologize. We try to make amends. So that is weakness. Weakness means there is some uh, some uh, some negativity within us, which temporarily overpowers us. Mm? That's weakness. But there is wickedness. Wickedness is where, uh, where somebody very intentionally, knowingly does what it takes to hurt other person. Hmm? So we could say weakness is hot-headed. Wickedness is cold-blooded. The wicked person very knowingly, so it's not that they practically don't have a conscience. They don't feel bad on doing anything bad. And they don't use their intelligence to control their anger. They use their intelligence to say express their anger in a way that will hurt the other person the most. And maybe hurt it in such a way that nobody else will come to know about it. Or there will be no evidence of it or whatever. Mm -hmm. so, so generally speaking, in the weakness and wickedness, they are like on a spectrum. So we could say everybody has weakness, but some people have wickedness. So with respect to weakness, we all need to tolerate and forgive each other. But with respect to, with respect to wickedness, you know, giving forgiveness to wickedness is foolishness. It's like, suppose some terrorists you know, in America, there are some of these people who just take guns and they shoot people. Or they are terrorists with the guns shooting people. And there is a security person who is fighting. And they both come in front of each other and the terrorists, his gun is exhausted. And then the security person says, okay, I forgive you. And the terrorist takes another gun and shoots the security person. <laughs> yes, indeed. So what happens is, where there is wickedness, there has to be strong action. Now, of course, we shouldn't presume that the people who hurt us are wicked. They may be weak in a way which is far more than maybe what we consider as weakness or what we experience as weakness within us. So with respect to the... <coughs> see, Draupadi was not just hurt or humiliated. It was at one level her personal humiliation, but another level it was also what it symbolized. Now, there are sometimes, uh, there is some sexual violence. Say if somebody abuses or violates a woman. Normally somebody might do it in a private place where nobody catches anyone. Hmm? If somebody tries to violate a woman in public, no, that means they are really, they are so brazen that they are not afraid of anyone. Worse still, if somebody comes in a police station and there they try to violate a woman, that means they have no fear of law at all. So what the Kauravas tried to do to Draupadi was like that. In the assembly where justice is to be delivered, that's where they were violating all justice. So it, took, it was not just a personal humiliation. It was a brazen exhibition of utter disregard for law, for dharma. 
And, and even that was not just one incident. There had been a series of incidents. When Duryodhan was just a teen, he tried to poison Bhima. Later on, they tried to burn all the Pandavas. And although Draupadi made that vow, but eventually Draupadi also agreed when Krishna was going as Shanti Dut. If peace can be had, let us have peace. She was not happy with it. She was obviously she was so hurt by what had happened. But she did not stop. She did not consider Krishna's going as a peace messenger as a betrayal. She accepted that. So that means they although at that time she got very angry but, and she took that vow, but it was it was not so much revenge as the war of Kurukshetra was not a war for revenge, it was a war for justice. And when the Pandava, when the Kaurava showed no remorse, when Krishna himself went as Shanti Dut, sometimes you may say, I have done everything humanly possible. The pa Pandavas did everything humanly possible and you could say everything divinely possible also. Because Krishna and God himself went as a peace messenger. And Duryodhana completely rebuffed it. He said, I will not give you enough land even to what do what I put the tip of a needle through that means you know there is no repentance no reform no re no reform it's just same brazen uh, shamelessness you could say brazen uh, recklessness so such a thing had to be punished so now most of us in our day-to-day -day relationships People may trouble us, but it's never to this extreme. Maybe when we are hurt, we might feel it is unbearable. But it's never to this extreme. So, rather than desiring that the other person be hurt, you know, maybe we can, we can pray that the other person be transformed. Or we can pray that maybe we get greater strength to tolerate what they are doing. Or we can pray that maybe this situation be resolved in some other way. No, we don't, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's actually very presumptuous and even dangerous to assume that we are good and the other person is bad and we should invoke God's power to destroy the other person. Yes, they may be bad and we may be good, but there is bad within us also and there is good within them also. So yes, if we are troubled, certainly we can pray. But rather than uh, rather than seeking the hurt of the other person, seeking that the other person be harmed, we can we can presume give people the benefit of doubt. Don't presume that they are wicked. Presume that they are weak, and see how that weakness and the difficulty that arises from that weakness can be best dealt with. Okay, thank you. Hare Krishna. <laughs> okay. We asked the question of Prabhu. Yeah. Uh, after death, where will we go? After sleep, where will we go? That is my question. Okay. After death. Okay. Du so during sleeping, where do we go? Mm, okay. Now. It is like a, they say it is a temporary death. Okay. 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 Okay, during sleep, where do we go? Is it sleep like temporary death? Okay, this is a little complex. Basically, as I said, there is the body, the, the, the soul, mind and body. Mm. So, there are different levels of expression of consciousness. When the consciousness from the soul comes through the mind to the body and to the outer world. That is called the Jagruti stage. Or we could say wakefulness. That's where we all are, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> so then the consciousness comes from the soul to the mind, but not to the body. That is the swapna stage. That is the, that is the sleep or dream stage. And the soul's consciousness does not come even up to the mind. That is the Sushupti stage or the very deep dreamless sleep. 
and the soul's consciousness goes directly to the spiritual level that is called turya or samadhi hmm? so these are four broad states of consciousness this is talked about in the upanishads and normally the soul we could say exists in the body like right now your soul is in your body my soul is in my body and from there the consciousness is going outward but this is while well, this is a this is a correct understanding it is also a over simplified understanding for the purpose of communication the soul is spiritual and being spiritual it it does not have a literal physical location that it it is not that it is completely amorphous but you cannot apply physical dimensionality in a very literal sense to the soul hmm? say if i'll give another example to illustrate it say if you ask anybody where is heaven if they have any religious sense what will they say up isn't it <laughs> now heaven is up now if you consider say people in england they say heaven is up people in australia they say heaven is up but the earth is round so up is two opposite directions <laughs> <laughs> so where is that up <laughs> is it <laughs> so when we say heaven is up that up is not in a geographical sense hmm? that up is in a moral sense that in a ethical sense that we exist at a particular level and heaven exists at a higher level of reality so those who are virtuous those who live ethically they go to heaven so we may use the word up but it is in more in a it is more in a conventional or a conversational sense it's not in a literal sense of heaven being up so similarly when we say the soul is in the body the soul is not a physical entity soul is spiritual so we could say where are we, what to speak of where do we go in sleep where are we right now so basically we could generally the soul is broadly said to be in the region of the heart but the soul what is it it's like say if i have a flashlight the soul is like the flashlight and the consciousness is like the beam of light so now where do we go when we ask this question what does it mean now we could say that means where is your consciousness like sometimes you are talking with someone and then we see they are lost somewhere we say earth to you earth to you you know don't go to some other planet come back to earth you know we got so basically what happened that means because where their consciousness is that is where they are so somebody might be physically in this room but if they are absent minded then are they here or are they not here well it's both their body is here but their consciousness is elsewhere so in the sleep stage we could say that the soul uh, in for practical purposes is in the body hmm? if you are practical in the sense that conversationally it says soul is in the body you can't pinpoint a physical location literally but the soul is in the body but in the dream state the soul soul can refer to the like the torch light the soul can also refer to the consciousness the beam of light coming out so in the dream state the consciousness can go anywhere and everywhere so in the dreams uh, we might you might be in india you might be in england and if you want to be with your loved ones in india in, in, us, in our consciousness might go to india at that time so our consciousness might go, go to another physical place our consciousness might go to an entirely imaginary place mm -hmm. we might imagine a place which has the affection of india and the comfort of england <laughs> you know <laughs> so in in dreams we might conflate two images or two two real things we might conflate to create something which is imaginary so where the consciousness will go in dreams that is unpredictable so in that sense we can't say where exactly we'll go but it is talked it is sometimes in the upanishad it said sleep is like temporary death in the sense that at death there is no action happening at the physical level action stops but the soul and consciousness exists somewhere else so similarly in sleep state the soul stops manifesting itself at the physical level but the consciousness goal consciousness is still active elsewhere so in that sense so no activity being there at the physical level in that sense it is said sleep is like death temporary death okay thank you hare krishna how did uh 
what do you mean by the uh, purit- purification of uh, mind? <coughs> the mind, uh, you know, we, we, are, we know that sometimes uh, we are conscious that uh, sometimes we have to do the good things, uh, avoid bad things like that. Mm. So do you mean that uh, purification of mind, is it uh, kind of a developing a consciousness that, you know, we, we always do the good things? Uh, that's that's one thing. Can you give me a little more deeper understanding? Uh, what is a scientific approach? Is there a scientific approach, or you know, the way that you step by step you we purify it? I mean, I know that I mean we, okay. we experience chanting, okay. um, you know, kind of blissness, uh, thing, But what what is beyond it in terms of purification? Okay, yeah. Thank you. So, what do we mean by purification? Basically, um, let's consider. Uh, like we say pure water or impure water. When we say impure water, that means water is there, but something which is not meant to be present in water is also present there. That's impurities. So purification of water means the impurities get removed. Mm-hmm. So similarly, purification for us means that the impure desires get removed from within us. So it can, this can happen at various degrees. At the first level, if at least there is a recognition that this is impure. So I don't want it here. It's like sometimes if a, if a room is so dirty, if every, when everything is filthy, nothing seems filthy. If like a room is like a junk where there are 150 items best piled up, you put 150 and you don't even notice over there. <laughs> <Isn't it? laughs> so a very highly impure state is where we don't even recognize the impure to be impure. There are so many impurities there. But just to recognize the impure as impure is also one level of purification. Hmm? Just recognition that this is impure, that's one level of purification. And after recognition, we can have regulation. Regulation means I have impure desires, but I won't act on them. So, yes, this dirt is there, but let it not be prominent. Let it not spread. So, recognition is the first level of purification. Regulation is another level. But purification at a highest level would mean that elimination. Say for elimination means, for example, say... (coughs) Some of us, maybe before practicing bhakti, might be eating meat. You might have loud meat eating. But now we practice bhakti for a few years and we take prasad. The prasad is literally higher taste than if you're traveling in a train or a plane and somebody <coughs> neighbor starts eating meat. Now, we may not even feel tempted at all. So the same thing, which tempted us, now we feel no temptation. We might just turn away from it. No, I don't want even to see it. So what has happened? There, the desire itself has gone away. Regulation means the desire is there, but by our discipline, we control the desire. But at a higher level, elimination means that the desire itself goes away. So we could say purification is uh, uh, recognition, regulation and elimination. But most importantly, purification, because we are talking about consciousness and desires. So here, uh, it's not just simply like water from which you remove the impurities. Consciousness is active always. It's to be conscious, is to be desirous. So it's not, purification is not so much about removing the impure desires as about re-establishing the pure desires. So... Pure, pure state just doesn't mean there is, say, no lust, anger, greed. Pure state means that there is the pure desire to love Krishna. So purific- when our attraction to Krishna becomes so great that even if there are, there are wrong things, there are impure things, we don't feel tempted by them because we are loving Krishna. So uh, for us, if we try to remove the impure, it's a laborious process and we feel de- deprived. Because, oh, this gives me some enjoyment, I'm not supposed to do it. But if we focus purification not on removing the impure, but on reinforcing the pure. Just try to develop a connection with Krishna. Find out 
what is it that we are attracted to in Krishna and try to strengthen the desire. If you like kirtans, just hear more kirtans. If you like to hear classes, hear more classes. If you like to do worship on the deity, do that more. And strengthen that desire. And that pure desire will become so strong that the impure desires will then be crowded out. So for us, pure, pure, complete purification means complete attraction to and absorption in Krishna. Okay, thank you. One question. Eh? Uh, there is. Wait a minute. You had a question over here. Yeah. Sorry, related to the same question I was about to ask. Yeah, so there is a saying that uh, some people say, at least if not everybody, there are many Devis and Devatas, but there is only one Mahadev, Shiva. So if I attract towards Shiva, and I, can I again still reach whatever you say, reaching towards Krishna? And how is it related? How is Shiva and Krishna related? And my question is, how are the two questions related? Two identities. Yeah, yeah. What, what do you mean? Like there is Krishna, there is Shiva. Okay. And we never you know, okay, we are okay. always talking about Krishna and okay, wait, wait a minute. Let, let, I, and they're two very separate questions and <laughs> Uh, there is some relation, but it is like a very, uh, you could say, a distant relation. <laughs> okay, but let me try to rephrase your question. If I understand right, what you are asking is that uh, there are many other religions which are which are spreading very widely, but where the Upanishads are very inclusive, um, but still uh, Hinduism is struggling. That's the question. Yeah. Well, firstly. <clears throat> the different religions uh, at one level they are cooperative at another level they are competitive cooperative in the sense that if we consider the bottom if we consider mountain climbing the bottom of the mountain is material consciousness the top of the mountain is spiritual consciousness and different religions are like different parts of the mountain mm -hmm. so each path might have its uh, facilities and might have its obstacles and we accept that by following different paths also people can get to the top of the mountain everybody can go towards spiritual consciousness now who will take which path now that at one level depends on who so they are all the religions are cooperative in the sense that all of them are meant to take us to the top of the mountain but it's competitive in the sense that whichever religion promotes itself the most whichever okay come up, come up by this path come up by this path uh, they will come they may attract maximum followers now of course sometimes what happens some people instead of climbing up the mountain they just keep going round and round at the bottom pulling everyone down from the other paths <laughs> so that may also happen mm. so oh, the which religion uh, spreads most that depends on a lot of factors primarily it depends on its proponents so if we proponents on those who are teaching it sharing it living it so if we consider broadly speaking Indian history there is the idea that the Abrahamic religions the Judaism Christianity Islam broadly speaking uh, they have this idea of exclusivism that means this is the way and that is not entirely wrong because they say it's like a doctor tells a patient that a patient you know, you've got this disease take this medicine but then the patient says oh you know I went to this doctor and the doctor said that and I went to that doctor and the doctor said that and I went to the doctor and the doctor said that the doctor says just forget everything else just take this medicine and you'll get cured 
Now, when the doctor is saying just forget everything else, that doesn't mean that all other doctors are wrong or all other treatments are wrong. That statement is made to create focus. But when a statement that is given to make focus is made absolute, then it becomes fanatical. So, there can be statements like that this is the only way but we have to see that in context and in intent we cannot make it an absolute statement but some religions do that whereas the uh, whereas the broad dharmic path is that yes there is one purpose but there can be many paths to that purpose so we could say that there is uh, the there is the exclusivist way which is this is the only way the vedic way the dharmic way you could say is more inclusivist there are many different paths but unfortunately because historically India was ruled by foreign rulers and we can't just blame the invaders it was see, the dharmic culture was based on the brahmanas and kshatriyas living virtuously but the brahmanas became corrupted since Shringi abused brahminical power and he cursed so brahmanas lost power and thereafter kshatriyas also became Corrupted. If you see Indian history, Kshatriyas are often Indians were fighting among themselves, and they didn't see the bigger danger or defend themselves. So when the uh, when the proponents, the protectors of a religion, they become weak, then no matter how strong that religion may be, that it won't manifest that much in this world. See, God acts in this world primarily through His representatives. Occasionally, he himself descends and acts, but most of the time, God acts through his representatives. So, now if those representatives uh, don't act responsibly, then God's presence will become less manifest. So, we don't necessarily have to see other religions negatively. Every religion has its share of intolerance, and yes, some of the Abrahamic religions have been very aggressive against Hinduism, but it's very easy to put the blame on others. It's more important to recognize that some weaknesses in our own tradition also because of which we became vulnerable but we do see that there is a significant amount of resilience and even resurgence that's happening that <clears throat> we see that a lot of India is still among one of the most religious countries in the world and even Indians who leave India and go abroad often they start uh, exploring their roots more not everyone but many and as there is this resilience and resurgence and as the followers of a particular religion become more responsible in understanding and sharing then it will spread more and more is that answer your question yeah. okay, thank you so now how much time do we have to I don't want to go on endlessly I don't think okay yeah yeah, I think that's a good idea. If you can serve Prasadana. But please don't make noise. Yeah, yeah. If you really make noise, please go out and make noise. Here, please don't make noise. Prasad will come to you, but don't make yeah. noise. If you really want to make yeah, just noise, let me, come on, go. Yeah, okay. Let me complete his answer, then I'll come to yours. Hmm? So, there are many devs, there are many devtas and devas, but there's only one Mahadev. So, what, do you, what about worship of Shiva? There is, there is a, in the Vedic path, like I said, the Dharmic path is very inclusive. That means that in the Abrahamic religions, there is the idea that God is a jealous God. Jealous God means that thou, one of the commandments is thou shall not worship any God other than me. Hmm? Hmm? That's one of the commandments. So the idea is that there is one true God and everyone else is a false God. So you give up the worship of the false gods and you worship the true God. Hmm? But the Vedic understanding is that God is not jealous. Hmm? That God is not jealous, he is zealous. Zealous means he is very eager for the elevation of people. So have you heard of this prodigal son story? prodigal son story is basically that it's in, it comes in the Old Testament that there is a very wealthy father and one of his sons is very rebellious and he says 
I want my share of the inheritance. You give it to me right away. And he takes it and goes away from his father. And he squanders it. And then he loses everything and he feels very ashamed. Now what do I do? But he comes back finally because he's too distressed. And his father welcomes him. Although he has lost all his wealth, father is happy that at least he's come back. And this story is told as a means to show how loving God is. That even if we reject him, even if he scanders, scanders gifts, still he doesn't reject us. He accepts us back. Now that is true that God is loving. But what the Dharmic traditions tell us is that God's love is not just that he accepts us when we return. God's love is also that he, uh, he accepts us even when we are not returned. What that means is that say if the father is like the head of the state, is like a king and the son is a prince who's quarreled with the father and gone away then the father and son has gone come out outside the kingdom somewhere else and is struggling now because the son had the had a quarrel with the father the son is not ready to come back home come back to the palace then what the father does is that okay he sends one of his ministers over there Hey, you know, you are you are working for this person. That person is troubling you so much. You work for me. You, know, you, you will have a good job and you will get good, good money also. And then you come with me. This is the place I will give you the job. So now what has happened? That um, minister who is paying the son. The minister is getting his money from the king only. But because the son is not yet ready to come back to the king, to his father, the father creates a via media, creates an intermediary that you be with him. In that way, he's drawing him closer to himself. Although he's not yet ready to come fully to him, but at least come one step closer to him. So in the Vedic understanding, the devatas are like that. There is one supreme being, but God manifests at various levels, in various forms. So there is one supreme being and that one supreme being is like we are all like souls, we are children and God is the supreme father. So we are all his children and we have turned away from him, we have to turn back to him. But if we are not ready to turn back to him, the Abrahamic religious idea is if you don't accept God, you are going to go to hell. It's, no. Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita is not like that. If you can't accept me, you worship someone who is connected with me. So Krishna is not interested in his own worship as much as he is interested in our elevation. And that's why if you read Bhagavad Gita 7, 20 to 23, Krishna says, Kama ista ista irita jnana prapadyanti anya devata tam tam niyama masthaya prakrityanya tasvaya He says those whose desires are very strong, they don't desire me but they desire other things. They worship various devatas. And they follow those particular rules according to their nature they worship. And then he says, Sataya Shraddhaya Yukta Stasyara Dhanami Hate Labhate Chatataha Kaman Mayaiva Vita Anita So when they do this kind of worship, they get the results. But it is I who am ultimately giving the results to them. It's like the minister gives the salary to the, gives the money to the prince. But it's the king who is ultimately giving. And then Krishna says, Yo yo yam yam tanum bhakta shraddhaya architam ichyati tasya tasya achalam shraddham tam eva vidhadham yaham So if somebody wants to worship a particular form, a particular devta, Krishna says, I make their faith strong in that worship. Why? Because at least by that connection they will get elevated. So just like if this prince is wandering homeless, if the prince develops, is not ready to develop faith in the father once again, in the king. But at least the prince develops faith in the minister. So then the minister is, minister is also looking very wealthy, very powerful, uh, very kind. Okay, develops faith. So the king may provide the minister all the resources that will inspire faith in the, in the prince. So it's coming from the king, but although right now it is not taking him to the king. It is taking him to the minister only. But similarly, if we consider the scriptures, the scriptures, they Vedaishya Saravai Ahameva Vedya. The ultimate purpose of all the Vedic scriptures is to bring us to the one supreme reality, Krishna. 
but for those who are not yet ready to come to him there are ways in which they can come to someone who is close to him and that's why within the broad vedic body of knowledge there are scriptures which glorify the other devtas also there is shiva puran which glorifies lord shiva there is um, there are there are books which glorify ganesh there are books which glorify brahma and the whole idea is even these scriptures come from krishna why for those who are not yet ready to worship krishna there is the facility that you just take some steps forward so if somebody is worship somebody say for example somebody is a, is a atheist and somebody becomes a worshipper of sadashiva of shiva lord shiva that's wonderful they are at least becoming from materialism they are coming to pious materialism hmm? now if somebody worships shiva purely hmm, then shiva will guide them forward sometimes in this life sometimes in the future life so our purpose is not to disturb people's faith our purpose is to elevate people's faith so if somebody just in the family shiva was being worshiped and say worship shiva then okay understand the philosophy and you can worship krishna but if somebody is very deeply devoted to the worship of shiva we don't have to demonize that worship we don't have to condemn that worship let them follow that now how where will they go how far will they go that depends on their consciousness that depends on lord shiva's guidance how they take it so it's it's a progression so you could say that there are we are talking about different paths up the mountain so some paths might take up to a particular point in the mountain like one guide takes us up to this particular point and from there another guide takes us there might be some guides who can take it right from here to right up to the top also so the worship of devtas is given to make a spiritual elevation more inclusive that those who are not ready to devote themselves to god there are alternatives which are within the purview of god although they are not directly connected with god so there is elevation through these paths also and if somebody is devoted to them we respect them for that devotion and if somebody is just nominally practicing it then we encourage them to philosophically understand and practice krishna bhakti okay thank you yes what is the explanation for the magical powers and the evil powers on the basis of science uh by magical powers what do you ref- what are you referring to which 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 okay and evil powers what do you mean like black magic or something okay okay so what is the scientific explanation for uh so for say uh magical powers or evil powers you know i was uh at a conference of neotic sciences so there was a, a representative who had come from peru you know south america and they're telling that just near uh there's a, there one of the major research institutes over there near the that institute maybe a few a f- maybe say a few ma- kilometers away there's a there's a place which is reputed to be haunted hmm? and whoever goes there they disappear so so there's this scientist they were asked you know will you go there says we are scientific we are not stupid <laughs> what does that mean we are scientific we are not stupid basically see sci- the study of science itself has shown us that the universe is much more complicated than what we normally perceive so one of the well documented effects is called as say staring effect staring effect means what say all of us sometimes sense somebody is staring at me so we look behind and then that person embarrasses and looks away you know, especially say somebody who is very attractive they often get stared at quite a bit now what happens that there are no eyes behind our head for us to know that we are being stared at but we all get that sense sometimes and quite often it is right So there's an experiment also done about this let's say if i'm sitting here and somebody is behind me and i have to guess 
are they staring or no yes or no yes or no so now if it were simply guess work i would get it 50% right but almost everybody gets it 60% or more right some people get it more than 95% right now how do they get that so so now this is something which is empirically documented but it is not theoretically explainable for science science has ex so you could say experimentation or observation and theory so you cannot deny the evidence that this is there but you, you don't have the explanation for that the scientists have also done some the uh, uh, psychic experiments on random number generators that means random number generator say can generate any number between say 0 to 9 just giving a simplified version of that experiment so but if that number generator is generating in front of me and if i stand in front of it i say let him generate 7 let him generate 7 let him generate 7 now if i just concentrate and desire that uh, over large samples the percentage of 7 coming increases and the amazing thing was that this is you don't even have to be right next to the device this was a this was princeton university had a quite a big lab for doing these studies so somebody might be in london the machine might be in princeton and here they desire let it produce seven 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 and there the probability of seven increases the so how is this happening so the point is that again there is evidence but there is no theoretical explanation so like i talked about there is the physical mental and spiritual so <coughs> science studies primarily the physical phenomena and it is very powerful in studying those phenomena but as far as the mental is concerned science doesn't have much understanding of it it's you could say out of scope out of syllabus but there are just there are objects which interact with the other through the mind at the level of the mind so those are what are called as subtle powers and what we say call as miracles so miracles are not against science they are above science that means they operate at another level of reality science operates at the physical level miracles operate at the subtler level at the sometimes they might be at the mental level sometimes they might be at the spiritual level so if i am being stared at how do i come to know physically there is no way i can know but at the level of thought at the level of the mind something within me senses it oh somebody is staring at me so that's subtler level now within the subtle powers there can be many different powers uh, but there are some, there are some set of powers which are like negative powers or black magic so black magic can have various aspects to it but <coughs> essentially the idea is that just as physical technology can be used for good or for bad similarly subtle technology can also be used for good or bad now they while in principle we accept that there can be miraculous powers there can be black magic also in practice we should be naive and gullible it's not that anybody who claims any kind of magical actually has magical powers most magic can often be just trickery so but in principle it's possible that something might be some things might be miraculous and if somebody is facing a lot of trouble if somebody starts imagining maybe somebody is in black magic against me well it might not be black magic it might just be that you, know, you are being too negative you are being uh, you just don't want to work hard and you want to justify your lethargy and justify your negativity so we shouldn't assume that whatever is happening to us is a result of the subtle powers in practice we need to be a little naive not naive but skeptical but in principle if we are open minded we can understand that the universe is bigger than our conception of the universe and thus there can be powers which uh, the current conceptions of physics do not uh, accommodate okay thank you going by this logic if i buy a euro millionaire and i say think so strong that this the, my number should be in the euro millionaire the lottery okay okay going by the say if we consider the random number generator yeah then can we 
use that say for lotteries and applying it to nice. win a lottery yeah rominder see the random number generator uh, it was a statistical experiment repeated over a very large nice. number of samples nice. and it was more of a increase in probability rather than a specific occurrence coming by prediction it's not that i say that this should be 7 and it will be 7 it's rather that over a large number of iterations if i desire 7 the probability of 7 occurring is more so it's uh, so it's basically i would say that there are two extremes one is to consider that the mind has no power hmm? that how we think that has no effect at all hmm? the other is to think that the mind has all power that means if we think in a particular way that is what will happen so the mind is neither impotent and nor is the mind omnipotent the mind is not god just because just by thinking a particular thought it's not that whatever we think is necessarily going to happen the mind is an important factor in actions in what we do so therefore if we in a concentrated way think about a particular thing deeply intensely then consciously subconsciously you know, we might attract our own thoughts our own intelligence our own insights in a way that we make choices that lead to the fulfillment of that result fulfillment of that desire so the mind does have power and that's how positive thinking does affect things positively and mind body medicine is a big field where if a patient is has a positive attitude patient is positive and optimistic that i'll recover then they recover faster the patient is pessimistic and negative then they recover slower but that doesn't mean that a person has terminal cancer and they think i'm going to get cured and they will get cured necessarily now, there is a reality which is not necessarily always affected by our mind so we have to have a balanced understanding the mind random number generator indicates the mind has potency it does affect but the mind is not omnipotent that whatever we desire will happen right okay thank you yes please uh, sorry i have a question no but that's fine that's fine no problem my question is regarding uh, sanatan parampara and islam islam and sanatan parampara like i got so many friends who are muslim i work with them but way the thinking when you observe and the way they behave according to like when you notice the difference between two persons thinking the and way islam spread in india in the last 200 years way started we what most of us knows the history so when the islam came in india most of the men came there wasn't any female came actually as per the my knowledge so when the islam came to the men so why first thing is why other faith exploiting the women or marrying them and uh, producing a child to belong to the faith is it something very strong with their dna or their memory consciousness with islam when the islamic man marry to a woman who belongs to different faith more likely their children going to be not becoming a hindu or christian or anything else they're going to become muslim so what is the strongest element they carrying within them they converting now right now is 1.8 billion muslim on the planet earth and the sanatan parampara is all this starting from manuel satupa and we are very getting less and less why the certain faith was really strong hold on the planet earth and why the faith we belongs to or practicing little bit or up to a certain extent is getting weaker and weaker are they really targeting something are, are you observing any targeting process or not <laughs> okay <laughs> It's a very politically incorrect question. <laughs> okay, let me summarize the question and then I'll try to answer it. So, Islam has spread quite aggressively and especially say it uh, Muslim men marry women men from Muslim men marry people from other women from other religions and then the children become Muslims and is it that something in the DNA because of which it's spreading very fast why is Sanatan Dharma not spreading why is it weak? 
the two different things over here. First, let's look at Islam and then look at Sanatana Dharma. Basically, every religion, uh, almost all religions, generally had a separation of spiritual power and political power. Say, for example, Buddhism, Buddha was the spiritual head, but it spread primarily when Ashoka became the king. Now, Ashoka was also Buddhist, but he was not considered a spiritual leader. He was a political leader. Jesus was a spiritual leader. But Constantine or other Roman emperors, they when they took Christianity, that's when it spread big, big time. So there is the in the Vedic tradition also there are Kshatriyas and there are Brahmanas. The Brahmanas are the sources of spiritual power, Kshatriyas are political power. So this separation of spiritual and political power makes sure that that the spiritual is not used for political purposes too much. However, in Islam, the spiritual head and the political head are the same. Muhammad is both the spiritual teacher and he is also a political warrior. So now, if you read the Quran, there are there are spiritual teachings over there, which at an individual level inspire many Muslims to live a more pious, more virtuous, more charitable life. At the same time, the leaders of Islam, when they want to teach Islam, they focus not on the spiritual teachings of Islam, Muhammad, but his political example. So at an individual level, Islam can be a spiritual search for truth for individual Muslims. But at a group level, at a social level, Islam often becomes, more than other religions, a political search for power. Because its political leaders, they quote Muhammad's political example. So this, you could say, is a not a defect but a vulnerability. And there are self-interested people who have exploited that. Now as far as uh, the expansion is concerned, see every religion, uh, Christianity tries to expand. That is, uh, expanding is not the problem. It is how you expand and what is your attitude towards those who do not accept what you are saying. That is the challenge. Yeah, that's, that's where the yeah. Right yeah, right yeah. Right I already complete that. Yeah. So now, from a broad philosophical perspective, that so, so Islam is spreading because it's a uh, multiple ways. As you said, reproduction is one way. Other way is conquering other lands. Now, physical conquest might not be so much, but it's more subtle conquest. But either way, I said earlier, religions are also competitive. Whichever religion pro propagates itself, it will spread. And uh, we we should not reduce reality to black or white. There are some people who are politically very correct and they say Islam and Islamic violence, they are completely unrelated. So these are just a few fringe elements who are terrorists and they have got nothing to do with Islam. That's to try to, to be, is to paint Islam entirely white. There are some people who paint Islam entirely black. They say this is a violent religion. Well, reality is never like this. Reality is never completely white, never completely black. And if you look at almost every religion's history, there are people, there is violence that has happened that that religion also. So there are shades of grey always, but because of that particular mixing of political and uh, spiritual heads, power, Islam you could say is more vulnerable for political violence, for it being used by others. Now this does not in any way reflect on the character of any individual Muslims. Muslims at an individual level are ultimately people are human beings like everyone else. Everybody wants to get on with their life and they choose a religion that helps them get on with the business of life. So we have to be aware of the, the political expansionist nature of Islam. But at the same time, we should not become prejudiced against Muslims at an individual level. I have Muslim friends and one of my friends told me that you know, as a is a moderate, he says, as a moderate Muslim, I can connect better with moderate Hindus and Christians than with extremist Muslims. Sometimes the differences within a group 
may be more than the differences between two groups. That means the difference between the moderate and the Muslim, uh, extremist in Islam itself may be more than the difference between a moderate Hindu and a moderate Muslim. So this balance attitude of you know we have to be aware of the political threat, but we don't become personally prejudiced against anyone. We have to have that balance attitude. Now, as far as the as far as the uh, Sanatan Dharma is concerned, like I talked earlier, that it's not that uh, it all depends on how we practice and how we share. So traditionally, in India, the Brahmins they became more uh, privilege conscious. We are the high caste, and the Brahmanas are supposed to do two activities. Now, one is they take Brahman bhojan. People offer them food. They take the food, and then with the tongue, they take food. But they are also supposed to give knowledge which is meant to create spiritual values. But if somebody becomes very priest oriented, not a teacher oriented, then they just take the privilege, but they don't discharge the responsibility. And one reason why, if you see, uh, yes, there are many Hindus who might convert to Islam, but there are many more Hindus who just become materialists because their own tradition doesn't make any sense to them. And that's because nobody's explaining it in a sensible way to them so if we take the responsibility to understand our tradition and make it more understandable to others then we all can make a difference small or big so it's important for us to those who are uh, in the centers of influence and uh, they take the responsibility to share things in a more effective way and although things Sanat Dharma is not as widespread as it might have been in the past remote past but still, as I said, there is resilience and there is resurgence that is happening. And that's a positive sign. Okay. So thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada Ki. Hi.